<risa> Buenas tardes a todos. Ahora hablamos sobre uh, Sync código con Python 3 y Sync Go Module y Tornado Module. Pues yo soy uh, ucraniano, vivo en Alemania, pero tengo apellido español, Cáceres. <risa> Por eso hablo algo castellano. Uh, la parte técnica es en inglés, pero si, pero si quieres me puedes preguntar en español, no hay problema. ¿vale? Bueno. Ok, uh, primero, ¿quién soy? Uh, yo soy un full stack developer, uh, yo uh, trabajo con JavaScript, con HTML, CSS y también con Python y backends con Python. Estoy haciendo Django, Tornado y uh, uh, algunas cosas diferentes uh, con backend, la mayoría de mi tiempo. Uh, hace más o menos cinco años que trabajo con Python y trabajo en Munich, uh, en la empresa Scooby. Es una empresa uh, pequeña, pero estamos haciendo muchas, muchas cosas con Python. Uh, es un uh, ebook subscription service. Tenemos también uh, los libros de español. Tenemos más que uh, un 100.000 uh, libros ahí. Y lo más importante, tenemos Python 3 en la producción. Por eso, uh, cada día trabajo con estas cosas, tengo que escribir un un código en Python 3 y tengo que hacer eso uh, uh, muy efectivo y para nuestro sistema y por esto hoy tenemos este plan bueno primero uh, qué es async y por qué necesitamos esto segundo uh, el módulo módulo async -O. Uh, la teoría, después un poco de tornillo y después uh, los ejercicios y código. Bueno, ahora es la parte técnica por eso, inglés. So, uh, why, uh, why do we use this buzzword, asynchronous at all? Uh, I think that the easiest way to get started with this is if we do a quick recap of the web, service, uh, web servers. Uh, how did they historically evolve? How do they work? So let's begin from the very early point where we had a threaded web server. Uh, what does threaded mean in this context? Is that we had uh, one request, one thread. Whenever a new client connects, we create a thread for him, we serve that uh, request in a thread, request is over, thread dies. This worked pretty well because the model is very straightforward. Uh, it's very easy to parallelize this way because uh, just perfectly logical to create a thread with isolated environment each time a new client connects. But that's kind of a waste of resources there, because as soon as we have too many clients connected, then uh, since threaded threads are expensive for the operating system to create and as well to kill, this system just doesn't scale well. Therefore, to address this issue, what can we do is we can just set, okay, let's have kind of a threaded model, but let's uh, limit the maximum amount of threads we can have per web server. This is what we call the pool. So let's say we fix, uh, I don't know, uh, 20 uh, threads in the pool. Whenever new client connects, he gets a, a worker, a thread worker from the pool. This uh, thread worker handles the request. Whenever there is more clients and we have thread in the pool, then we just wait. What we have with this as advantage is that our system does not crash when we have too many connections. The disadvantage is obviously that some clients have, have to wait first, and the second, that it's still not the most efficient use of our system, in most cases. So and here is when the asynchronous idea came into, into our minds. So since most of, most of the time, the system actually does not do a heavy computation in the world of web services. Most of the time, we are just waiting for I.O. Would it be a database? Would it be another, I don't know, caching server or another web server? Most of the time we would be waiting for some, something else and not for ourselves and not for our computing power unless we do some heavy math, of course. So the idea was uh, why do we need to create a thread really for each client? What if we have just one thread but we manage somehow the workflow more efficiently in that uh, we do not just sit and wait, block our system whenever we need to do a database query or whatever else we can do other work meanwhile. And this is where this asynchronous stuff comes in. But you can say that this is something that not comes with Python 3. It was there for ages. And that's right, because 
Actually, even in, in Python, like we have Tornado that works asynchronously, it's six years old. We have Twisted that is 12 years old already. And there are tons of uh, analogous systems in other languages. Yes, we have that all, but the common thing is that we are still mostly u using uh, the blocking servers instead of asynchronous servers. The reason is pretty simple. It's because it's just much easier to read, to maintain, and to extend. You can see that the Django is blocking, and we love it because it's nice and easy. The Ruby on Rails is blocking, but it's still very nice, and we use it because it's easy. So would it, wouldn't it be cool if we could use this uh, easiness and efficiency of Python, but could write a nice asynchronous code at the same time? So combine the both of both worlds. And this is when Python 3 comes in. I'll, I'll do a, a little remark later, like we can also do most of the fancy things with Python 2 already, but Python 3 just brings it to the next level, so let's assume that that's what we have from this day. Um, as a teaser for you in a glance, what will we work uh, today with is, you probably already know that yield from uh, a sub-generator delegation system, syntax that uh, was introduced in 3.3 as far as I remember, and uh, I think IO module that was <laughs> but it's backward compatible with 3.3 as well. So let's start with a little, just very brief recap of yield from. So what, what's the difference with normal yield and what is the yield at all? So this thing, it aims to replace callbacks uh, to keep exactly the style of the code sequential and not to create the callback hell. So before I can argue about getting rid of callbacks, even though it's one of the main topics of this workshop, we'll need to see why callbacks are bad and why we want to avoid them. It's difficult to maintain a nice code if you're writing in a callback style because you can have spaghetti, callback hell, whatever you call it. And this is uh, code taken from mongo.js. This is my favorite example. It's difficult to maintain. So sequential code looks nicer, and uh, that's what we will be doing today. We will try to write sequential code, uh, asynchronous code, in the sequential style. And for this, we will be using yield from, which we will work on later. So, uh, so for everyone to be on the same track, I'll do a basic recap, like what, uh, what's, uh, what is yield from at all, and how we will be using it today. So imagine this. This is an example of the synchronous get request of some abstract web frame. <coughs> we have a, fun a handler function, uh, the get, then we do some huge database query, we have the result, we do self-write results to the client. This is straightforward, yeah? So we will <coughs> spend most of our time here. And our system will be just idling, we will be waiting for the database to finish, but since it's a blocking call, we will have to wait. So how would we do this in JavaScript or in Python with a callback style? We could define uh, another function that would be a callback, that will be called when the database query is ready. We will put uh, self-write in there, so basically this part that uh, gives the data back to the browser. We will call the huge database query and add the callback as, a, as an argument. So that the huge database query will call automatically on results callback when it's done. So as I showed with MongoJS example, this leads to nesting of the callbacks, and this is uh, often difficult to maintain and to read. So today we are training to use yield from maximum. So what? Uh, who of you actually worked already with uh, yield from asyncio or tornado? Okay, uh, then I'll just uh, do more expla explanation here. So what is the magic? This will not work just like this by itself. We need a set of tools that will be powering this system to work. Just putting yield from instead of callbacks will do nothing if we do not have a system that is supervising this code that can actually schedule the task ex execution in the right order. So what yield from actually does here is uh, it makes a generator out of this function, uh, so so-called coroutine. And this coroutine will execute till this point, and then when it will see yield from, it will bring the execution back to the caller of this whole thing. And then this caller has to be smart enough to uh, 
uh, work with many of these core routines to see, okay, you're working now, ah, you yielded back, okay, now you are working now to jungle with the core routine. <coughs> it's called the IO loop. So when the IO loop gets something yielded back, like a huge database query function or whatever, it's usually uh, waiting data on some socket of the operating system, then it's now the operating system task to do the work of waiting for the database. Uh, if we are here mostly Linux users, I suppose, and uh, if it's uh, people, if it's uh, Mac, then it's KQ, if it's Windows, then it's most likely Select. We use the system native uh, queues to maintain the order of the tasks and uh, to process signals that we get from the operating system sockets when some data is available to be read. In example with the database query, for instance, when, uh, when we do this, the operating system will start the TCP connection with the database server, do something other, some other stuff in Python. Then when the database server is ready, it sends us back the reply, operating system sees, oh, okay, data available on this socket, tells it to our IO loop, so the supervisor of this thing. Then the IO loop will notice, ah, okay, this data is ready, we can continue with this. And it will send the execution back to this point, and the code will proceed just as normal Python code, as, as if this part would not be here. So the whole intelligence behind the scenes is switching the tasks and catching the operating system events when some data is available and bringing the Python execution back to the place where it was left. So what's the role of Async.io? Uh, it's a library that has all of the tools for us to build this system that I just mentioned. So Async.io has uh, coroutines uh, uh, as a generator and since Python 3.5 as a spatial syntax construct, async. Then it has uh, classes for futures, classes for tasks, <coughs> and the IO loop. Let's begin with the coroutine. I just explained you already briefly uh, on the previous slide, what is it? But this is a recap anyway. So it's a function that can, as a generator, it can return, and it can remember the state where it was. And then when the uh, when the caller will think, okay, now you can continue, it will continue from the place where we left it, as if this yield from was not there. That's a coroutine. Now, event loop is this supervisor that is managing the coroutines. So event loop comes with async.io, but we have also the tornado event loop. But this is not something super intelligent, it's just some loop that will manage the coroutines and see at what point of time which one executes. It basically waits for events and it dispatches them to the right places. Then the future. So since uh, the code of uh, getting, uh, for instance, data on some URL or on some uh, TCP socket is a blocking call. Of course, we cannot use a library like uh, URL lib requests, uh, well, our favorite fancy HTTP libraries. We need a library that will not wait until the call is ready. We need a library that will return us uh, some promise object, a future, and then at some point really get the result from the socket. So for this, async.io comes with a future class that encapsulates this logic. So any task can be wrapped in a future so that, uh, so that we do not have to wait for the real thing to come. We can give the caller the future and later at some point the future will evaluate on the real thing and we can read it from it. Uh, who of you worked with JavaScript? Okay, so you might find this familiar to the deferred object in jQuery or to promise in Angular. It's essentially the same thing. So async.io works with futures. Uh, future is a basic placeholder for the data that is not ready yet, but we don't want to wait for it. It will be available at some later point. It's kind of a placeholder object. So async.io can yield futures or it can yield coroutines that will yield futures. So it's kind of uh, a chain, we can, we can build a chain of coroutines, but at the end there is always a future, because the future is what will, what could block, but will not, because we are using uh, async.io. So now Tornado. Uh, Tornado has a very, very similar concept. Works in a very similar way, uh, but it's backwards compatible up to Python 2.6 or something. 
you can all already use that. It's, uh, I'm using that in production for years now. It's a full set web framework and we will also be doing some exercises on it today. It's compatible with Async.io now and I think that, I hope that eventually the uh, loops that they're running will somehow merge. Right now we need to use adapters to make them compatible, but that works natively so that's okay because adapters are also developed by Tornado. Uh, why I included it to this workshop? Because with this framework you can already do the real stuff and run it uh, on the real system and I think you is still in provision of pace so that the API can change. It makes no sense to do some reliable, serious projects with it yet. We need to wait a bit. So to sum up this introduction, uh, what do we have? We have the application layer, we will be using Tornado, or oh, there are already some libraries for AsyncIO available too. Then we need some I.O. framework, the loops that will run this thing and supervise it, this will be AsyncIO. And then on the level lower, on the operating system level, we need something that will actually uh, maintain the task queue and check the socket connections. That will be uh, some system that is native to our operating system. EQ if all are selects, depending on, on what we use. Uh, some words about the event loop. Uh, as I said, Tornado has own event loop and uh, I think AO has another event loop. But we can exchange them, that works pretty easy. We have one exercise that will cover this today too. Also, the futures are different in Tornado and in AsyncIO, but there are again adapters that will convert one to another, so you can uh, you can so say uh, make futures of SCKO <coughs> to be more uh, Python 3 friendly, but still use them with Tornado. Now time for the exercise. So I structured this workshop uh, in a way that oops. Uh, I structured this workshop in a way that uh, I will not show you here much of the code. You will have to write it. So who has uh, system that is ready for that, time and interest. I will walk around, look and help. Uh, those who want to be more in the read-only mode, so to say, more listen, that's also not a problem. You can ask me questions meanwhile. Uh, yeah, so we are split now into two groups, so to say, the active group and the listening group. Um, to do this, first we need to find out if we all have the requirements. So, first obviously Python 3.4. Who has that? 3.5? 3.5 is even better. Okay, most of us. That's nice. Good. Um, then, we will need async.io, we will need uh, EO HTTP and Tornado. These are three dependencies that I would ask you to install. You can use 5VN for that, or if you have it already system-wide, then it's also fine, of course. So I will just give you a minute to do that. I can I can write the requirements here. So install that and then one minute we can Special for you. And you're also compatible. Any help needed for installing this stuff? Oh, one. 
Let's do one, one little preparation task, uh, so to say. So for timing things to have some accurate measurements, it would be very cool if you would make a very basic, like you can copy and paste some Hello World web application that will wait <coughs> one second and return some greeting back to the browser. Use any, br use any web server that you like. Thank <laughs> you. 
dummy web application, so to say, but you can use anything. You can use simple HTTP server or Python or whatever. You can also just copy and paste that. That will run a web server, wait one second, and return you hello world in the browser. So we need this part running to then uh, run async IO tasks together with that. the URL in case you need it because I'm changing the slide. <coughs> so now uh, as getting started task as well we can use any HTTP libraries that we liked for example yes <laughs> Uh, to execute, you run uh, Python and uh, the name of your. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, there must be something wrong with that. I'm new because I just clicked it and it says um, I have an attribution. <laughs> Thank 
from
We do not have to. We can, but we don't have to. We are just getting warmed up and we need something to compare to. So I would say for this task you can use uh, URL if that's the easiest. <coughs> execute one second, right? Because it's blocking all and it's waiting. So does it feel like one second in the shell if you run it? Okay, good. Yeah, roughly. Good. So for those who are connected to the internet, there is a nice possibility to play. So we can uh, share our IPs and we can uh, try to access uh, the computer, uh, the web server of the neighbor. So who has uh, Wi-Fi connection and who likes to contribute the IP? I will write mm -hmm. first mine so you can try it. Yes. 
Thousand requests? Mm, no, we we'll will just try. It waits for one second, so. Thousand requests will come The easiest would be to put So we need one more IP contributor. and then prints uh, the results to the shell. And this should take three seconds because we are requesting sequentially three IPs which will wait one second each.
Okay, this will be the last boring task, I promise. Then we go into a okay. So the majority has it? Yeah. Okay, wait for three seconds. Obviously, we want to make the same thing basically synchronously, and we are starting from doing the total the same task, requesting one IP and then three IPs. So we start with just one, but now we will be using the AsyncIO module and uh, IE or HTTP uh, client library. So uh, for this, uh, I would ask you to open the documentation to have some nice reference. So we'll just look for. AIO HTTP first, and I will help you with uh, structuring the code. So, in a glance, uh, what do we need to change from our uh, basic version <coughs> with using requests or URL list that was fetching one, uh, uh, one IP greeting? So, we will have a similar uh, function that will do the similar requests. Instead of URL lib, we will be using AUHTTP, and the syntax is similar to request. It's AUHTTP.get and pass in the URL with port. This should work. Uh, but as I said, this uh, client, it will not return you the response right away. It will return you the future. So as I had on my slides, we will be using yield from in front of it. I will put the slide on in a minute. Just uh, doing a quick recap. And we will need to run this function, not uh, not just call it in main, but we need to run it on the I.O. loop of AsyncAO. And this is just one line of code. So I will put you the skeleton and you will write the rest. that they have on their documentation to work with like the client that sample work like yes. on the shelf. Yeah. But yes, but on their example I think they're using 3.5 and you have 3.5 so it should work but not for everyone else. Oh, so like that way. Yes. So you mean like a simple server? Yes. Yeah, for the other five it's correct. So it's incorrect. It's incorrect? Correct. It is correct, but only if you have 3.5. Oh, that's good.
So I put for you the basic skeleton. Uh, you probably have it similar thing from documentation, but on Asimkio website and also on IUHDB website, we have the code for Python 3.5. Most of us have Python 3.4. So this can be a, prob a problem, I guess, if you are copying and pasting. They have a new syntax introduced on 3.5. I'll speak briefly about that later. But just for you to have, uh, this is the basic skeleton that we need for this task. So we have two imports, as in KO and the UHTP. Then we have a URL, for now just one. Then we have a function that will be doing the request. And we need to decorate this function with a SYNCAO coroutine. This decorator actually makes this function a coroutine. So it says to our, uh, it says to Python that, hey, this thing below is a coroutine. So be ready, it will not behave as normal function, it will yield us futures. So this is very important, it indicates that asynchronous code goes below. And then 3.5 they replaced this with the async uh, syntax keyword. So in the new Python it should be async, that, and the function. But we can just use this, it's good enough. <coughs> and then this code is uh, just uh, managing the I.O. loop. First we need to get one, it's usually a singleton. So we are getting it with this magic method. Then we are running it, we are saying loop, loop uh, run until complete and our function. So that I loop does not wait forever as it would usually do, it just runs this thing and stops. Then we print the result and we close in a glance. And this part is still missing, uh, this is probably what you are now looking up in the docs. That's uh, the fetching code of the IUHTP client. I'll paste it there in a minute. In the example of closing the client instead of the loop, is that a question of... Uh, I mean, in the first example they show on... Uh, mm -hmm. Does that, does that make a difference? I mean, you're closing here. The, you're closing the loop. Yes, you're closing. It will work without it. So we don't have to. I'll just remove it. So the thing is that you can have multiple loops, but you need just one. Yeah, we don't need much. 
So as you can see, I updated the code here. Now it's a complete solution. This is the part that was missing, and it's pretty simple. I'm sure you found uh, in the beginning at least on the docs. But we use yield from here twice. You might be surprised why. Because the first yield is not to wait for the HTTP clients to get response from the server. So the response comes, and the IO puts us back here. We have the response. But in HTTP, the response doesn't have to be synchronous. It can be a, a, a long polling session, for instance. So if you are getting the response, it does not mean that you are getting the data yet, or all of the data yet. So this is why we have a second view from the test. Okay, and now you have the response, but get me all of the text that is there. That's why we need two, because it's kind of two blocking operations, not one. And this should hopefully bring you the text. So if, if any of you check the time for the interest that it takes to fetch one URL, you might be surprised in some situations that actually the time that it takes to run the same thing on a single URL is often more, well, a bit, <laughs> but more than the same thing but in the blocking way. So obviously since we have just one URL, we're not using the capabilities of a synchronous request. We're just using uh, a single request, so no parallelism there. And we have a huge uh, overkill of using a sync IO event loop in this case, because why would we need the loop to make just one request? No sense. There are nice benchmarks in the network. Uh, also, I made some trying to see when is it appropriate at all to use the IO loop. And usually, it's when you have uh, at least more than one request, obviously, um, <laughs> that has to be done. But, not always, because if you have more than 100, then it's not efficient again, because then uh, if your system uh, is not configured correctly, then you can co consume all of the, well, more than a thousand. You can get all of the slots your operating system has for opening sockets, and then you're crashed again. So it's a bit tricky, but let's say that from one to a thousand, it makes sense to use this thing. From two to one thousand. And then again, uh, both async IO and tornado are configurable. Uh, that you can put the, the limits of the parallel requests. Like Tornado would have just 10 by default, so you would be surprised. After 10 requests, you are going again uh, synchronous. <coughs> yes? I was like, I really see the advantage of using the server side. Putting it together is not like threatening to run multiple threads in the request. 
Like what? Why is why would this be better than just using friends? Yeah. It depends on, on your on the client. Yes, yeah, it depends on your task. So a typical example of the client side would be a crawler. So you need to go through some web portal, let's say, and crawl all of the pages. And then if you're opening a thread for each of each page, depends on what are you crawling, yes. So if you are crawling something really big, then you can end up with uh, thousands of threads, and then it will be just too slow. And what about so having a thread? thread? Do you see any difference from having a thread? Of course. So your system will not crash if you limit the amount of threads, but then you will be slower. Because generally, when you're writing the crawler, the processing will be pretty fast, the processing of the page itself. You will parse some keywords, you will uh, do something with that analyze, but that's not a heavy mess. So like 99% of the time it will take for your script to run, will be waiting for the website to send you the reply. And then why would you waste a thread to just wait for the reply? Okay, so everyone has a very basic example of a sync you're running. Good. So congratulations, you have your first nice async AO code. Of course we're going to make it more nasty now. It's get a bit tricky because you, if you run this in a loop, it makes no sense. You will be blocking the same. So you somehow need to have three futures here and then yield all three of them so that it understands that it should run them in parallel. Look up the documentation and I will be pasting the solution for you line by line. I will give you a little hint. Uh, look, if you have the do docs of async.io, look for async.io.wait. Async.io.wait is basically uh, the function that allows you to combine uh, multiple coroutines of futures into a single one so that it runs them in parallel and releases when all three will be done. So look for async.io.wait. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm David, the solution to help you to get started. So here is a replaced version that is using a simple.wait and then I built a list of uh, features with list comprehensions. So this is how it used to be. I think I used to get URL, but now I run this three times for three URLs and then I give this list to async AO wait and I yield that. This will return us a tuple and in the box of AO.wait you can find out what's inside of the tuple and then you need to do some more steps. You need to yield the result again to read the text out of responses as it was in the previous example. Don't be surprised with this tuple, so response tasks is a tuple. It's not exactly the, the same thing as here, the list of, of the features. It's a tuple, and on the index 1 you will have actually your tasks, and on index 2 you will have nothing. I know it's funny, but it's written in the docs. Thank you. 
Okay, I should be back. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm receiving again. Good. So I just posted the second part here. Um, this is done wrapping the results. Uh, the text, the text out of the HTTP responses. So it's very, very similar. But in the first place, we had to use HTTP.get to actually fetch the resource, and in the second task, uh, we are getting the text out of the response. Most times, we need to combine multiple uh, tasks with asyncio.wait, and most times we need to yield it so that IO loops does the heavy lifting for us. Try this. Tell me when you're ready. The first one being the result. Yes. And the other one is pending results. I want to do. Ah. So and since we do not need pending results, it's always empty. It's a bit funny. Like result that failed to complete or the no, the pending yeah. ones. <coughs> you can configure the SyncIO to yield you the value back right away, not even when it's ready, when it's in progress. Uh, For so some so reason, if you would, yes, if you would need it, then you yes. can have it. But in most cases, you just need the first element of the set.
So I think that way, like the responses always have the dot result method. Yes. Or that's an I that's an HTTP thing. Or that's a thing of futures and tasks. So it's always dot result. Yes. So whenever you have some asynchronous library uh, that works with asyncio, mm -hmm. when you call the library like fetch or get something from a database or whatever, that will return you the object that will have the result method. Object is a placeholder, and when it's ready, you call dot result and you have the result. It's the same. Task is a subclass of the future. So task uh, is uh, future is a very general thing because there was a module in Python 2.6 uh, concurrent futures. It was a similar thing. It was not used the same way, but it had the standard interface for Python. And then I think you implemented a subset of futures and called it task. It has a more strict interface. And uh, there is documentation of uh, SNK online, and you can find those very specific methods that are available in task, but also but not available in features. But essentially, it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 you don't have to think of both single features, that's enough. They just call it a task to be different from Tornado. Yes?
but the concept is totally the same. So you will find the very similar syntax. Just the classes will be different. I pasted here the skeleton that we can reuse. I will go now line by line with you to explain it. This you can just copy. It's a hello world app of Tornado, basically. Working in the client mode right now. So what we do here and what's different. So first, uh, imports are different, of course, because we are importing the Tornado stuff that is six years older than the SyncIO. Then, we use a coroutine of Tornado, so this one is defined in Tornado Gen. It has own decorator syntax for coroutines, but on the background it does the same thing. So it marks the underlying function as something that could give <coughs> you promises of futures. Then, we cannot use IUHTTP. We will use a sync HTTP client that's again part of Tornado, imported here. So use this line to create a client. It's very similar and it's, uh, it's using CURL, I think, on the background. So it's pretty reliable. I wrote some crowders with it. That's a production ready thing. And then in the main block, we are instantiating the loop. So this is something similar to async IO gets, uh, IO loop gets current. But this returns us tornado IO loop. And then uh, in I think here we used uh, wait for result, and here we use run sync. It's the same thing, a method that runs on IO loop, telling do not run forever, just do this one task, and that's it. So copy this, and then we will together put two, two missing lines here that will do the asynchronous stuff, yielding part. I'll just copy this. Yes. Yeah. 
So I pasted the remaining two lines because it makes no sense actually for you to try to guess them. So since uh, Tornado is six years old, back then we did not have yield from. It's just one year old, the yield from thing. But we had generators in Python for a while. So uh, Tornado is using uh, generator-based coroutines and those are using yields because yield from just didn't exist back then. Essentially, it's the same thing. The only difference for us uh, is uh, what Tornado does internally. So we do not see it, but internally Tornado is processing features in a totally different way because it has to guess that this kind of generator is used for us to do asynchronous work. So it's Tornado internals, it doesn't have to bother you. But if you use a similar thing as we had with asyncio example, so client.fetch, we had client.get in previous one, now client.fetch here up. And then we yield it, save the response, then we need to read the body, that's it. We do not need, uh, as in asyncio, to do the yielding twice, because 
when this will return, when this will yield the result back, we will already have the, all of the text. So, yes, basically, Tornado async HTTP client is combining these two steps together. At this point, you will already have the results to decode and read, so you do not need to read it again. So, try this, and then there will be the very last thing. You will, of course, do again three requests in parallel. Okay. Should it print it? Yes. Yeah, it says print text. Okay, but I
So is tornado example running for you? <laughs> you have a question, yes. <laughs> okay, then uh, last bit of attention, please. Now we will be, of course, changing this to fetch three URLs for us instead of one. And for this, I will not, I wouldn't like you to go through docs. Let's just do it together right now, right at this uh, code block here. So with Tornado, it's totally simple. That's why it, we, do, we don't need to do this whole thing. So how would we normally uh, create a, a list of the futures? Like with list comprehension, we would do something like this. HTTP client fetch URL. We would use now the local URL or URL in URL, something like this, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's basically, this will return you now three responses instead of one response. Of course, you cannot decode it like this. Now you need to add the loop to decode each reply, but basically that's it. So we will do for In terms of uh, performance between uh, the solution in async IO and uh, the tornado solution, uh, is there a big gap? I didn't test this part, so I don't think that there is any difference actually. But this is not so clean. So what's, why does this magic work? We are yielding not a future, we are yielding a list. But Tornado will introspect the things that we yield, and we will, it will see, ah, we have a list. Let's see what's inside of the list. Inside of the list we have futures, okay, then we can do the magic and just process those futures. This is very nice, but it's a bit dirty, because Tornado has to do the guessing. It should open the list and look inside. What if we would yield another iterable? If we would yield a tuple or a generator or some custom iterable, it could take it wrong. But in this particular case, for simple tasks, it's perfectly compatible. So we do not need to combine three futures into one future using any hex. We can just yield a list of three or a dictionary of three. And this both cases are covered by Tornado. I think IO, in contrast, will not allow to yield anything except of the future or a quality. <coughs> so that's kind of a restriction that makes your code less uh, error prone. So it does some kind of extra checking for you. You cannot yield the wrong thing. But then you have to pay with flexibility. So you need to manually wrap it with asyncio.wait. Okay. So check if this works for you. And that would be response Well, the rest you know. So of course we need now to append it somewhere, or like we have that. Thank you. 
Friday night. <laughs> That's really. It, it's not a stereotype about Spain, right? You, you should be drinking sangria somewhere on the beach, but no, we are doing the work. That's very good. That's Python community. So, thanks a lot. You can still catch me around to ask something, but the workshop is done. See you around. Thank you.